This week's episode is sponsored by White's Beaconsfield. White's Beaconsfield is the number one company in the UK to brighten up your smile at a very affordable price. Get your perfect smile today using code AGJAMESENGLISH at checkout for a 15% discount on all products. from White's Beckinsfield. I'm on day five out of seven and my teeth are looking white. So it doesn't contain peroxide, so it's very, very safe for you to use on your teeth. It doesn't cause any sensitivity and I've literally got the most sensitive teeth. The most affordable product, works like a dream. Look how white, with no filter, no sensitivity, and it is just one of the best that I've ever used. Right, that's three days, it's crazy. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Late 2014, there was a Freedom of Information request where somebody said they wanted access to all of Essex County Council's compensation payments over the last year-long period. And then I come across this one and it says alleged abuse, 70 grand compensation. So I ring the switchboard up and <laughs> this lady answers the phone and I uh, say, oh yeah, just, just can you put me through to Dennis King? And she said, who's calling? I said, Charles Thompson. And she just went really silent. If nobody believes the newspapers, then when the newspapers expose something bad that's going on at the heart of government or the justice system or something else, you can't get any traction for that, so people just dismiss it. So when you're talking about a paedophile ring, it's not like there's somebody sitting at the top going, oh, I think I'll set up a paedophile ring. It's just that these paedophiles, that, that's how they operated. So it was almost like a safe underground network, so I, I won't go down the park and try and procure a kid in case he goes running to his mum, I'll get a kid that can be relied on to be quiet, and that's all under lock and key. You can't get access to anything from those cases for until about something like, you know, 2080. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got multi award winning investigative journalist Charles Thompson. How are you, brother? All right, thank you. You okay? It's good to see you. Yeah, really good. Thanks. First of all, thanks for coming on the show. That's a pleasure. Thank you. Your work's phenomenal, brother. Fascinating. I listened to the podcast um, you did on exposing the paedophile ring back in the eight, 80s, was it? South End? Yeah. What was that called? The Lost Boy? The, the it's, yeah, it's called Unfinished. Unfinished. Shubery's Lost Boys. Yeah. yeah. Phenomenal. Thank Listen you. to it. Um, through what you've done, you've been, like I say, you've been presented with numerous awards because of undercover, the bravery of what you do. Um, we'll touch on a lot of things, but I always go back to the start of my guests, find out a little bit about yourself, and um, we can take it from there. So, whereabouts did you grow up, brother? Well, I was born in um, North London, but I only lived there until I was a toddler. So, I've grown up in Essex, South Essex. Essex boy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, my family are all East End, um, you know, if you trace it back, um, or West Country, but uh, grew up in Essex. Yeah, we moved out to Essex in the beginning of the 90s. How was your schooling and stuff? Yeah, it was all right, just normal school, you know, went to state school. Um, There's not much to report. I didn't have a 
fantastically mm. deprived childhood or a very privileged childhood, just had a regular working class childhood. My dad worked building sites and then in a the factory. My mum was a stay at home mum and uh, then got a job in a school as a dinner lady. So it was mm. just normal. So a pretty normal kid. Yeah. No bullying, no fucking madness, no drugs. I think, nothing, just normal. Uh, oh, no, 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 no drugs or anything like that. Mm. I mean, I think most kids get picked on at some point in school, but, um, you know, I, c- I can't can't claim to have a tremendous soft yeah. story. I've watched, uh, I read a lot of your stories as well. A couple of people you've interviewed, like James Brown's missus, um, Michael Jackson, the woman who done the documentary and stuff like that. You've some fascinating people, man, with some stories that nobody really wants to touch on. How did you get into journalism? Well, I always wanted to be a journalist from when I was a kid, but I don't know why. So it might be Clark Kent, you know, because I used to love Superman when I was a kid, but for some reason I just always wanted to be a journalist. And then when I started in journalism, when I was about 18, went to university to study journalism, and it was not what I expected at all. I was quite a shy person, and journalism is all about talking to people, so that was really difficult. My first ever journalism studies class, the lecturer gave us all a notepad and a pen and said, right, go out into the high street and interview someone. And that was just so crushing for me because I was so shy, I hated it. Um, But over time you get used to it and now it's, you know, I couldn't do anything else. It's just a fantastic job. And I started out in showbiz journalism. Um, And that was mainly because, um, well, I was interested in music and I contributed to fan sites so back in the you know like the 60s 70s if you wanted to be a music journalist you'd contribute to like fanzines uh you know there was a prevalence of music magazines back then by the time i was starting that didn't really exist it was all online so i started contributing to like online music fan sites as a hobby and so i was getting to go and interview people be around people that were heroes to me you know motown musicians or james brown i was at james brown's last ever uh London press conference and last ever show and got to speak to him and ask him a question but it was all hobby stuff I was doing hobby journalism sort of just to get bylines so that you've got a portfolio of work so when you go starting to try and get proper work you've got a catalogue of stuff you can show them and so eventually that turned into paid work um, started writing for an American music magazine called Wax Poetics an American website called South News. Uh, I did stuff for Mojo here in the UK. Um, so it, it sort of went through a process of starting as a hobby and developing into paid work. But showbiz for me is not very interesting as a, as a subject. I loved it as a, as a teenager because I was getting to be around all these people that, that I loved, you know, that I grew up loving, like James Brown and uh, you know, like Martha Reeves and the Vandellas and George Clinton and P-Funk. Um, but firstly, most of my heroes are now dead or retired. And secondly, showbiz journalism is just quite bullshitty. It's like, uh, there's so much PR. It's the, the line has been blurred so terribly between PR and journalism. So the real stories, as you say, never get told. Yeah, you it's know. fake. It is fake. It's rubbish, really. I mean, the uh, you know, showbiz journalism, even if you look in the biggest tabloid newspapers in the UK, their idea of showbiz journalism is having their picture taken with a celebrity and saying, I was backstage with whoever at their mm. show the other day, and they reveal to me that they have <clears throat> developed an addiction, dot, 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 to M&Ms, you know, or just like, yeah, but, you yeah, know, it's yeah. just yeah. rubbish. Bill it's just stuff. absolute rubbish. Mm-hmm. So... I just completely lost interest in showbiz journalism and um, just went into regular journalism. So what's the difference from showbiz to regular? Well, in showbiz, there's so much control. Um, Does everything get watered down? Do you get told what to do, what to say, what's going out? Do you you have any power? Not not necessarily by the media companies, but it's, it's all controlled by PR people. So in order to gain access to the person to speak to them, you have to agree to certain conditions or they put strict time limits on you or you ask a question they don't like and they interject. So it's all controlled by these PR people. And the media companies are dependent on the PR people because if you cheese off that PR person, 
then they'll cut you off of all their clients, see? So if they represent 20 celebrities and those celebrities are people that the media institution needs access to, you can't cheese off their agent because then you lose access mm -hmm. to everyone. So that's why showbiz journalism is so Yeah, so you need useless. to be the good little journalist and jump through their hoops and people yeah. please or else you'll not get any more clients. Yeah, to develop a career as a showbiz journalist, you have to essentially be a PR person that's masquerading as a journalist. So it, it, it's almost impossible. If you look at showbiz journalism, you know, in the old days, like the old go gossip columnist type showbiz journalists, they really did investigate what was going on in Hollywood and break big scandals. Whereas the only people that that the media generally is willing to pick on now not pick on but you know expose is people who either have fallen out of favor already and then it just becomes a pile on so they will turn against a particular celebrity and just absolutely crucify mm -hmm. them endlessly uh you know just to, i'm trying to think of an example well daniela westbrook would be one you know yeah. who you know just once she fell out of favour, they all just piled on and it was just relentless, yeah. you know, every day, every week. Um, I had Dapper or, Laughs on um, last two weeks ago and that's what he says, the media kill people, actually kill them by what they say in the press from if their career's riding high, they'll promote them, do good, but as soon as they start coming down a bit of peg or two and start losing the credibility or they can destroy careers as well as much as they build them. Did you see this? Did you think yeah. media kill people also? Well, I didn't stay in it for that long, but of course, I, you know, I've covered Michael Jackson extensively, for example, um, from more of an investigative angle. Um, and you just look at what happened to him, and that was like just, even even before allegations or anything, if you just look at him in the 80s, where his only crime was to just be a really famous pop star, just the kicking that they gave him every day, you know, it, it's unbelievable when you look back at it. And some of the stuff they did to him, they would not get away with now, you know, in terms of the mental health slurs and things like that. F for example, you know, Frank Bruno, when Frank Bruno had his breakdown, the son called him um, Bonkers Bruno on and said he belonged in a nut house. I don't know if you remember that. Huge outcry and they had to apologise and withdraw the newspaper um, to this day, they call Michael Jackson Wacko Jacko. What's the difference between Bonkers Bruno yeah. and Wacko Jacko? There's just no difference. So, you know, and that he had that every day. So they pick targets and they just crucify them. But they only, they, see, they will not go over after somebody who they're dependent on. So if you have a celebrity who complies with you, who cooperates, gives you interviews all the time, all that kind of thing, they will never go after that person because it's they're too lucrative. So they only go after the people who are dead, falling out of favor, or refuse to cooperate. So, and you know that. So there's a sort of an element of corruption there on the side of the media. There's also an element of corruption just in the way that show business operates as well. And that's the other thing is that the more time you spend around celebrity, the more you understand. I've got to be careful what I say. Have you? The more you understand the power games that are going on behind the scenes and the powerlessness of the celebrities and the often very difficult circumstances that they're in where they're not really in control of their own destiny. And so the real stories are often not told. Yeah. It's scary to think that people have the power over your life, your career. But again, that's how you react to it. Now you see people slipping over there. Choose a girl, Caroline Flack who was crucified, they speaking about court cases before she'd even been in court and the pressure just got too much and the girl took her own life. Do you know what I mean? It is sad that it can happen to so many people when your career's riding high, certain stories can. But again, I feel as if the press, it's not to the high standard it was, it's not to the publicity it had 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. The numbers are coming down, everything seems to be going online. Podcasts, more people are starting to turn to podcasts because it's a real, it's a truth. Things aren't edited, things aren't watered down, there's no bullshit, there's no big corporations behind it pulling the strings, telling you what to say, telling you what to wear, telling you what to think. I think the game is changing, I think people are starting to understand that, yeah, that it's not always, what, the truth ain't always what you see in black and white. Some people do believe though what they read from the press is all true, but I think more people are starting to waking up to realise, wait a minute, it's only bullshit, it's clickbait, it's just, um, yeah, they're in control of what they put out there and... 
Do you read it that much though? You will believe it. Mud sticks. Well, I don't subscribe to the idea that what you, everything you read in the media is bullshit. Mm-hmm. So most of what you read in a newspaper is true, but there's levels of truth. There's, you know, something may be true, but only part of the story, for example. So it might be true that this thing has happened, but if you rob that thing of context, mm-hmm. then actually there's something bigger going on. But, you know, it's, it's a very difficult situation because, you know, I am a journalist, I love journalism, and I love newspapers, and I do think that without them, we will be in really, really catastrophic trouble, democratically speaking, because the internet... It, it, it's created a platform for a lot of people, but the the downside of that, there are upsides to that, certainly, but the downside is that it's not regulated. And, for example, if I am somebody that believes that the Illuminati are running the world and that the Queen is a lizard, then I can amass a gigantic following. And meanwhile, a newspaper, which is employing, you know, professional investigators to scrutinize and fact check things before they go in the paper, is getting a fraction of the readers that, you know, Captain Illuminati is getting. That is a problem. So we do need proper professional media. But the problem is when the problem comes when you have people that have that media platform and they abuse it and then they discredit the whole industry. So if you have media who are caught lying about something, it just gives people ammunition against journalists in all walks of life. You know, now I don't know any journalists personally who make up stories, but when somebody does get caught making up a story, that reflects badly on all of us. And I think that as an industry, we're having to deal with that now. We're having to face up to the fact that there have been rogue elements within the journalism industry for a lot of years who have inflicted bad damage yeah, on our reputation. Like the bugging the phones and bugging people's apartments to get information. That stuff is always going to stick. Do you know what I mean? So it's difficult. Like if a journalist phones me, there's always that wariness that what they try to fuck me over for because it's hard to get... the. the you know the way they spin things, it can be difficult because it's always clickbait as well where, well, that's not true. and But they promote it in such a way where you say the context is took out but it looks as bad as what it is. So it can be difficult for anybody to trust journalists as well because, again, it's about sales as well. You don't think so? But big stories, clickbait, okay, people (coughs) buy that. Clickbait certainly is a problem and I don't like clickbait. Um, Because, again, it damages all of our reputation, you know, and I have fallen victim to that just as anyone has, you know, where you're scrolling down Twitter and some news organisation puts some misleading (laughs) headline and you click on the story and then you go, even, like, the story that I'm reading doesn't even bear any relation to the headline that I've clicked on. You know, it's just clickbait, you know, it's the dictionary Mm -hmm. definition. So they'll say, you won't believe what this person has revealed about themselves and then you click on... And you're scrolling down and down and down. You're going, it's, 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 there's nothing here. There's nothing revelatory. It's just nonsense. So that, it turns people off of the media. And it is a problem because then without a properly functioning media, you can't have a properly functioning democracy because if nobody believes the newspapers, then when the newspapers expose something bad that's going on at the heart of government or the justice system or something else, you can't get any traction for that. So people just dismiss it. So if you have, you know, Donald Trump, just as an example, has weaponized this phrase, fake news. Now, the overwhelming majority of the things that Donald Trump describes as fake news are not fake news. They're completely true. But on the rare occasion where something does go out that is fake news, and he says it's fake news, and then it turns out it is, that discredits journalism as a whole. So then his followers now... Every time something negative is published about Donald Trump, they say, oh, fake news. Mm-hmm. It's not fake news. But, but those rogue elements who have been caught publishing fake news, they have now damaged us all. And when that problem becomes widespread, you just lose a properly functioning democracy because there is no watchdog that can be trusted to hold people in power to account. And so, you know, I will always defend journalism and professional journalism but at the same time it is disheartening when you sort of have people letting their own side down 
Yeah. How is it when you're doing the journalism? A lot, a majority of newspaper as well, it is all negative press. Can that be tiring as well? Because there's so much goodness in the world. There's so much goodness that a lot happens everywhere, everywhere, but we don't seem to see it as much in the press or in the radio. It's all quite doom and gloom. Is that a tactic to create more sales? I think if something is functioning the way it's supposed to be functioning, then that is not news. So news is when you have discovered, typically when you've discovered something that's not working properly. So for example, if we had a fantastic test and trace system at the moment in the middle of this pandemic, then it would not be newsworthy to put on the front page today, hooray, 100th day in a row of good test and trace. That's not news. Because if the government sets that up, it should work. That's that's what it's been set up to do so you know if i switch on a light and it switches on that's not news because it's supposed to switch on when i push the switch right if if i press the light switch and the house blows up that's news <laughs> so you know if <laughs> so i think that necessarily if your job as an industry is to hold power to account then most of what you produce as news will be negative because you'll be saying this arm of government has done something wrong this is what needs to be done to fix it that's what our job is as an industry is to shine a light on things that have gone wrong to try to steer them right now there's a public interest argument with celebrity as to whether you know you know when you're talking about bad press like negative press for celebrities i think it is often debatable how much public interest there is in those stories you know if a celebrity is walking down the street and you know they've got their trousers on backwards and they look a bit of a mess is that in the public interest does the public have a right to know it's a difficult one again because if they've been walking down a public street then if you create a law that says you can't you can't run that story then effectively what you're telling people is that it's now illegal for them to know what's happening in a public street see so that is is difficult to sustain because that means if somebody gets murdered outside your house tomorrow you no longer have a right to know about it so it there there are arguments either way but a, a lot of just because you can do something it doesn't mean that you should and I think there is a, d a debate to be had about a lot of celebrity mm -hmm. journalism and, and the public interest value in yeah. it yeah so when did you start getting an investigative stuff so I was at university and while I was there I was working as a showbiz journalist and I ended up freelancing for the tabloids um, I did that until 2011 because I graduated into the recession. So the 2008 banking collapse happened. And, um, and as a result of that, there was a dearth of jobs in, um, in local media, so, which is where I wanted to go. I wanted to move into the regional press, PAYE, eventually. Um, and so I just freelanced. And I did court reporting and showbiz reporting, music features, that kind of thing. And then 2011, I got a full-time job in the regional press. And that was when I really started working on proper investigative stuff. How did you get into the, is it Shubery's, Shub, Shubery's Lost Boys? How did, yeah. How did, that, did somebody walk in who was being abused and confronted you to tell you they had a big story? Not quite, but it was along those lines. So mm. what happened was I had um, looked at a freedom of information request. So freedom of information is a law which exists to allow the public and the press to access information which is not publicly available. So, uh, for example, with your local council, any meeting that your local council has, all of the agendas and the minutes for those meetings are public and you have a right to access those. If you want to know what the councillors are talking about behind the scenes, outside of those meetings, Freedom of Information gives you the, the right to demand those emails and as long as they're not covered by certain exemptions you can then see them so freedom of information was used in 2014 late 2014 there was a freedom of information request where somebody said they wanted access to all of essex county council's compensation payments over the last year-long period and I downloaded this spreadsheet and I was looking at it and most of it was, you know, people that are, you know, personal injury, that sort of thing. People that have cut themselves on council property. And then I come across this one and it says alleged abuse. 
70 grand compensation. And this was right in the middle of the Jimmy Savile fallout, and Exaro was publishing all of its stories about the so-called Westminster paedophile ring and so on and so forth. And so historic abuse was a massive topic in the news at the time. And I run across, you know, a local authority paying 70 grand for alleged abuse. And I think, oh my God, like, this is a, a big story. So then I keep scrolling, and then there's another one. I was scrolling further, and there's another one. And eventually, there were 10 or 11 payments for historic alleged abuse at Essex Council. So I went to Essex Council and said, Here's a list of questions. Uh, for each of these complaints, I want to know the gender of the complainant, the age that they say they were at the time of the alleged abuse, the link to the council. For example, was it a children's home? Was it a foster home? Was it at school? You know, what's the council link? And a few other questions. And they came back and said, that's going to be another freedom of information request. So you're going to have to wait a month for the information. That came back on Christmas Eve 2014. And they refused to answer every single question. Every single one. Saying to answer these questions would identify the victims. Which is the phrase they used. They didn't say complainants. They said victims. Um which I disagreed with thoroughly. So one of the questions I had asked, for example, was in each of these cases, have you alerted the police to the alleged abuse? That's a yes or no question. Answering yes or no to that question does not identify the victim. So that was a ludicrous uh, defense that they'd given. So I rang up the press office and had quite a severe argument with the press office and hung up the phone. I was really angry about the way I'd just been spoken to and about the the their attitude towards the story which i felt was inappropriate um and i spoke to the uh, the news editor whose name was steve neal and uh we decided to go on front page with it first paper of 2015 essex council has been paying all this money for alleged abuse and they're not answering any questions so we did that <laughs> then we put it on the front page the next week as well with an update and we just thought right if you're if you want to screw us around right we're going to put it on the front page again. So about three weeks later, something like that, I'm just sat at my desk and the phone rings and um, the receptionist says there's somebody in reception who wants to talk to whoever it was that wrote the Essex Council child abuse stories. I assume that was you. I said, yeah, I'll be down in a minute. So I went down. It was a, like a, an, an older man, you know, in his 70s, white hair. And um, I took him into the boardroom and he introduced himself. His name was Robin Jamieson. And he had been the head of the psychology department in Southend-on-Sea in the 80s and 90s. He was an NHS manager at the time, retired now. And he said, I've seen your stories about Essex Council. I don't necessarily think what I'm going to tell you is connected to these payments. But if you want a story about Essex Council and child abuse, just let me tell you this story. <laughs> and so I sat there for an hour just listening to him. And he's telling me this whole story about, you know, this paedophile ring that wasn't investigated properly and the police knew all about it and didn't do anything and on and on. And I'm thinking, oh, is he nuts? You know, am I, am I listening to a nutter or am I listening to somebody who's telling me the most important story anybody's ever told me as a journalist? And it was the latter, you know, because as I set about trying to fact check what he was telling me, it was all stacking up. You know, <clears throat> these two men did appear in court. They were charged with running a paedophile ring. They admitted to running the paedophile ring, etc. So the more you looked into it, mm -hmm. the more you realised that there was substance to yeah. what he was saying. And this is Dennis King and something, Tanner, Brian, Brian Tanner. Tanner. Yeah. And these two were supposed to get life. It was in the 80s or 90s, but they made deals, uh, secret handshakes, and they only ended up getting, like, three, four years. Yeah, so what happened was they were charged with offences, including buggery, which was now it would be charged as rape and, um, and conspiracy. And those offences meant that they were eligible for life sentences for what they'd done. And this was not just, you know, a one off. This was for a couple of years. They were running this ring whereby it was wholesale. It was like industrial scale. They were grooming the kids, abusing the kids and then driving them around for other people to abuse them as well in different locations around Essex and beyond. And this was all freely admitted. You know, this was the bizarre thing about this story was that the case came to court. This was all freely admitted. 
And yet there clearly was a dissonance between what had been acknowledged in court and what had the outcome had been. So they are charged with these offences which carry a maximum sentence of life. And then on the day of the trial, the boys are there ready to testify. There were six boys ready to testify to specimen charges, which were indicative of wider abuse. They all show up at court. They're waiting to be called into court. And then somebody comes in and says, we don't need you. They have changed their pleas to guilty. Um, what the boys were not told uh, at that point was they've changed their pleas to guilty on much, much lesser charges. They'd done a deal. So the deal was that the buggery charges were reduced to attempted buggery and the conspiracy charge was dropped. It was allowed to lie on file. So they plead, the most serious offence they pleaded to was attempted buggery. So their sentences were reduced from potential life. They were expected to get 15 years to life and they ended up with four and three years. So there was a drastic reduction in the sentences of these two men. Um, and the question, obviously, that leaps off the page when you're reading this is, why? Why would they do that? Particularly because both of them had prior offences, similar offences. King, in particular, had decades of compulsive abuse of children. So his criminal record demonstrated that every single time they let him out of prison, he immediately set about abusing kids again. He was compulsive. So if you have the opportunity to put him away for 15 years to life, why would you seek to do a deal? They said we did it to protect the boys because it saved them having to testify. But none of these boys were consulted. Nobody came to them and said, would you prefer if we do a deal so you don't have to testify? They knew nothing about it. So there's a dissonance there between the official version of events and what's really happening. And that was what we set out to investigate was why did these two men get this extremely lenient deal and what happened to the rest of the ring? They appear in court and plead guilty to running a paedophile ring. Where's the ring? Nothing ever happened to any of the other abusers. So that those were the questions that we set out to try to answer. Mm -hmm. Well, so this guy King as well had photos of kids he was abusing up in his wall, like trophies. That was subsequent, yeah. So what happened was, as a result of that plea bargain, he was out very quickly. In Shoebury, a couple of years later, he's now back under investigation for running another ring, this time involving girls instead of boys, and then disappears, goes to the Midlands, um, or the east of England. And he um, just spends the rest of his life abusing kids and continuing to receive extremely lenient sentences. You know, as a story that we tell in the podcast where he was eligible for 10 years. Um, he'd just been to prison for abusing kids, came out and immediately was caught abusing kids again, comes back before the court, is eligible for 10 years, they give him 12 months and he's out in five. Wow. So you're just looking at this pattern and going, what is going on? And that was one occasion when they went and raided his house based on some intelligence they found that he had been photographing himself abusing children, developing the photographs and framing them and using them to decorate the walls of his house. Yeah, sick bastard. Is, um, so why is he, from getting a four-year sentence, doing the same but getting a lesser sentence, was he connected? Were they scared at the names that he were putting into the mix at the court case that they didn't want it to go any further, so they'd made a deal? Was there more behind the story? Well... <clears throat> That was the question we set out to answer. We think we answered the question because after years of investigating, I tracked down this source. So there was a source who worked on the original investigation in, in safeguarding the kids. And a lot of people were saying to me, you need to find this person. Um, and I couldn't find, I just couldn't find them. They weren't in the phone book. They were not on Facebook or anything. Eventually, it turned out they were on Facebook, but they were under a fake name, but I was able to follow a sort of a, a trail of clues on the internet, which led me to believe that this profile was in fact the person I was looking for. So I messaged them, got no response because we weren't friends on Facebook. So it goes into the, the hidden inbox, right? So months and months later, I get a message, but I've, all, I've almost forgotten I've messaged this profile and a, a message comes up from this person saying, you know, who are you? What's your phone number? Let's talk. 
I get them on the phone. It is the person I'm looking for. So I meet them. Um, <laughs> bless you. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I meet them in a pub, and they were so scared. Um, how do I know you're really a journalist? How do I know you're not a spy trying to find out what I know? This case is so dangerous, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I said, look, I'll do all the talking. I don't, I don't want you to tell me anything. I'll just show you what I've been doing for the last couple of years. So I'm telling them the story. Robin shows up at the office. Here's the first story we published. Here's what we found out there. And here's who I've spoken to so far. Anybody that had allowed me to share their name, I shared their name. And by the end of that meeting, they kind of went... I'm still not sure. You know, I I believe you're a journalist now, but I still don't know if I'm safe to talk about this case. So I left it a while. Then we met up again. And for much longer this time, we were together in, in a different pub. And th- this is how paranoid they were. They were like, par- they, it was counter surveillance techniques they were using. So I was on my way to the meeting and they rang me and said, yeah, I'm not where I said I was going to be. I'm somewhere else. So <laughs> I had to reroute and go somewhere else. So... After that meeting, the very end of that meeting, they said, I've got to tell you something. And they told me this whole story. So they, at the time that they were working on this case, they were in the middle of a degree, social work degree. And they were writing their dissertation and their dissertation was all about cases that they were working on at work. They were using them as case studies. Then the organization that they were working for got closed down. And this was like catastrophic for this person because they're right in the middle of their dissertation. If this organization closes down, they lose access to all of their source materials. They can't finish their dissertation. So what they did was they nicked all the documents. So all of the cases that they were using as their case studies, when this organization closed, they just took all the files home with them. So 20, this was 2018 I met this source. So... That year, some new data protection laws had come in, which basically said that anybody who was mishandling data, you know, private data, was eligible for an unlimited fine and prosecution. And they just, you know, had a massive panic and started burning all their files. And then the week that they found my message on Facebook, they'd had one pile of files that was left to burn. And after they spoke to me on the phone, they went and checked them. And in there was a load of paperwork about the Shubury pedophile ring case. And they said, look, I'll let you, on the condition that you never, ever name me, I'll let you look through all this paperwork. So I agreed. And then we got that paperwork transferred to a a legal person who is now holding it. And um, so I'm going through all this paperwork. And in there, we find a document which lists Dennis King as a police informant. Now, this is a couple of years after the Shubury case, after the, you know, the one that we're writing about, but nonetheless, he's listed in this document as a registered informant. So if you're looking for a reason why a compulsive paedophile might get a severely reduced sentence, being a police informant might be a good reason. So that appears to be the answer to the question. Now, what we still don't know is who was he informing on. Um, we have no idea. It doesn't say anywhere in the paperwork who he was informing on. So because the the question that, you know, that overwhelms this case is if you've got somebody who is raping children on an industrial scale, you, you know, normally a, ped- uh, a police informant the way the system works is that the lower down person informs on the higher up person. So Mm -hmm. when you're watching a cop drama and you're looking at a police informant, typically you're looking at a fence or you're looking at, you know, a small time drug dealer who gets pulled in on some chicken shit charge and then goes, all right, if you let me go, I'll tell you who the big boys are, you know, all that. But that system makes no sense that this case makes no sense within that system, because what could he be informing on? that is more serious than, than raping kids. him raping children on an mm-hmm. industrial scale and then trafficking them to other people to be raped by them as well. What could he possibly be informing on that would be more severe than that? That's the, the unanswered question. And some people think that maybe he knew of 
important people who were uh, abusing kids. Certainly when he was arrested, there was a story that appeared in a national newspaper that said that police believed that there were businessmen and civil servants involved in the ring. Another theory is that, in fact, he was not an informant. And effectively, he was being paid as an informant, but his job was not to inform because he knew too much about police officers because a number of the boys, we also found out from these documents, had named the same police officer as being a regular visitor to Dennis King's flat. Um, so, you know, what is... What, there's, we still have not got to the bottom of, mm -hmm. of what was really going on. We, we know he was a police informant or certainly registered as a police informant, which is that we're in a lot better position than we were when Robin walked into the office in 2015. Um, but, you know, th there are unanswered yeah. questions, certainly. If you've got a gangster or if you've got a drug dealer that's been caught, he's going to snitch on other drug dealers. Looking from the outside, I personally think, he, because in the court it says you're not getting done for rape because the boys as young as 10 were, male pr were prostitutes. So he was obviously renting these boys out to high-profile names, police officers, judges, whoever it is. So now it's like Jimmy Savile as well. Why was he never outed? Why was he never? Why did the people wait till he's kind of dead? Yet he worked with the royal family. He must have been vetted. Do you know what I mean? So the guys obviously had a lot of protection. That There should be no green light for um, you to abuse kids while you're putting other paedophile rings or other organisations in prison. Do you know what I mean? You shouldn't be making deals. You shouldn't be... Um, a high profile snitch to then for you to get a green light to abuse kids, it just doesn't make sense. But if he's renting kids out and it's a paedophile ring, it would have been all connected. There have been high profile names where they've been probably too scared to send them to prison for a long time because the names he could have uncovered. Look at the, the Epstein kind of stuff as well, where he says he killed himself. But again, the people say he was going to expose people, big high profile names. It is a connection. You, t if you're investigator, you'll know that it's connected. It's so much more than those six boys who are, were abused, and the connection it has up and down the country, worldwide. That these paedophile, this paedophile ring is is around the whole fucking world. It's so bad and it's so p polluted and so full of poison that it's not just a case of one thing. When you were digging into this case, did anybody ever try and pull you aside to say, "Look, stop"? Or did anybody ever tell you, "Was your life ever in danger"? Because it's stuff that, that, for me, but this is what I call a journalist, somebody who doesn't quit. Five years later, you're still working on it. You're still trying to find answers. You're not doing it for a quick fix. For me, that's what a journalist is all about. That's what I see as a journalist, not somebody who's just doing a quick story for clickbait. You have went deep, spoke to the people, spoke to the kids, put out old files. So I take my heart off to you and I respect that. So when you were doing your, the podcast, how can people watch this podcast, first of all? So it's called Unfinished. Mm -hmm. um, so if you just go onto whatever podcast platform you use, whether it's iTunes or uh, Spotify or wherever, if you just search Unfinished, it should come up. It will say it's made by Eastern Daily Press. Mm -hmm. um, or you can go to podfollow.com forward slash unfinished dash one. Yeah. How was it for the six boys going to court? Well, men now and getting told they weren't going to take the stand, they weren't going to face their abusers or... There's made a deal that must have affected that must as another slap in the face, yeah. So, um, in terms of those six, well, firstly, those six were representative of, of dozens, so those six were there for the specimen charges. So, they charged these six guys, uh, they charge over the abuse of these six guys, but the jury would have been told, You're hearing from six, but this is indicative you know we can't call 80 people here to testify so this this is just an example of what went on that was made clear at the sentencing hearing that this was that dozens was the word that was used at the sentencing hearing so the problem that we encountered with um tracking down the victims which we did track some of them down but a number of them were dead um through very unfortunate circumstances uh, heroin overdoses one shot himself um, so the, the, uh, the now so some of them are dead a lot of them are badly 
badly damaged, really catastrophically badly damaged. So um, homeless, drug addicted, in prison, one of them uh, detained indefinitely in a, a psychiatric facility. Um, so we tracked some of them down. I tracked down one of the six who was due to, uh, I, tra- I said I tracked, I tracked down and spoke to one, I tracked down some of the others, but they didn't want to cooperate. I tracked down one of the six and interviewed him at length. And he had had no idea that this had happened. Um, he went to court with his mum to give evidence. His mum got called out of the room. She came back in and said, oh, but they don't need you anymore. He's pleaded guilty. And so he just went home. That was the, He had no idea about the plea bargain, about the lenient sentence, certainly had no idea that this lenient sentence had freed King in particular to go off and just do it again and again and again. And he was just disgusted because he found this all out from me. Um, he was just infuriated, you know, and because the other thing is that Dennis King, in the middle of our investigation, Dennis King died, which is a whole other story about a police cock up, which maybe we'll come to later. So King dies. I get his death certificate and he's died of AIDS. And he was last in court for abusing kids a few months before he died. So this is a guy with AIDS that's abusing children. So that in particular infuriated this this person that I tracked down and interviewed. Um, so I can only give you that one person's perspective. They appear in the podcast, albeit their words are read by an actor because of the legal entitlement mm-hmm. to anonymity. Um, so you hear from them in whenever, it, I think, episode eight is when they react. So he died death. when all this was getting uncovered? Yeah. That's a bastard. I tried to track him down. That was one of the uh, one of the weirdest moments in the investigation. Was I found out where he was living, which was in a sort of a sheltered accommodation complex for OAPs, and I couldn't get a direct phone number for him. I could only get through to a sort of a switchboard. So I ring the switchboard up. And <laughs> this lady answers the phone, and uh, I say, "Oh yeah, just, just can you put me through to Dennis King?" And she said, "Who's calling?" I said, "Charles Thompson." And she just went really silent. And then she went, I know your name. It's in my file somewhere. And she wouldn't put me through. So that was kind of creepy. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought, how does she know? <laughs> how does she know my name? That was, that was, that was creepy. Um, you asked me earlier about whether I'd ever been threatened. Uh, not threatened. I did get a telephone call from a friendly person at Essex Police who informed me that I should assume from that day going forward that all my calls were being listened to. Um, But I think that was it. I think that was the only sort of threatening, slightly threatening moment. Did that ever make you want to stop? Did you contemplate it? No, I almost found it amusing because... um, I mean, the only reason it alarmed me slightly was because of the sources I was dealing with. I was worried about them being identified but we were specifically every time we found something out about this case we just dumped it in the public domain immediately because the only reason why anybody would want to shut you down is if you're sitting on top of something and they don't want it coming out so Mm -hmm. if we just found something out and just splurged it straight away into the paper we were sort of protecting ourselves so that's just what we did yeah so what was this king's job then what did he do um so when he started offending in the 1950s, he was a merchant Navy seaman. Um, he, at one time, worked in a sweet shop, which he used to groom children. Another time, worked in a toy factory. Um, at the time of the Shubury prosecution, he was his occupation was given in court as a cafe worker, but we know that he was dealing in stolen goods because we spoke to numerous boys who were in his flat and just said, you know, the flat was just full of stolen goods all the time. And part of the grooming process was that he was grooming these kids to go out stealing for him because that compromised them. So he now had something on these kids. You're involved in criminality. You've been breaking into people's houses, people's cars. So you dob me in, I'll dob you in sort of Mm -hmm. thing. So 
it was part of the grooming process that he would involve them in his criminal activities. What about Brian Tanner, the other one who was involved? He was a businessman, so he, uh, he ran a, 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 a scrap metal business. Um, now, by the, time he, uh, by the time of the Shubri case, he'd been prosecuted a couple of times already, um, and he was working as a lorry driver. But prior to that, he was running what had previously been his father's business. It was quite an established and well-known business in South End as a, a scrap metal company. And um, when he was prosecuted, that was actually quite big news the first time because he was such a well-known local businessman. But his, his earlier prosecutions were less serious. It was more sort of meeting a rent boy in a toilet and getting caught sort of thing rather than running a violent paedophile ring. Um, he also ran a skip hire business. Now, what happened to him after Shubri, we have no idea. He died so long ago that all of the records on him have been destroyed. So his prison records are gone, his police records are gone. So what happened to him afterwards is a bit of a mystery, unfortunately. Mm. And in the UK, our retention of public records is appalling. If you go to America, for example, and you wanted to investigate a case like this, the amount of information that you would be able to access dwarfs what you can access in the UK. I mean, in the UK, we've, in terms of official paperwork, access through public bodies we've got nothing why is that does that protect well, pedophiles as well um it's well they say it's in line with their retention policies so they say well we can't be expected to hold all data indefinitely so once a case reaches a certain age we destroy everything now i'm slightly skeptical of that system because firstly in america they seem to manage it perfectly well and secondly, if I want to go and research a Victorian court case that exists, I can go and get it right now. You know, there was a book that came out a few years ago called Fanny and Stella, which was all about a, a court case that took place at the Old Bailey during the reign of Queen Victoria. How was that book written? Because they went into the archive and got all the files. So how come you can go and get all the files from a Victorian court case? But if I want to research something that happened in 1990, you tell me it's too old and it's been destroyed. It's slightly farcical yeah. the system in my opinion we need to retain this stuff mm -hmm. indefinitely you what's know? the thing where they can hold it for 75 years before you can look at it that's certainly because we found a we found a connection uh between dennis king and the shubri ring and the dirty dozen gang um that murdered uh, not murdered that killed at least uh three young boys mark tildesley barry lewis and jason swift and um so we tried to get hold of the records from those cases to see whether King and Tanner had fought, had ever appeared in, in that case, uh, whether they'd been interviewed or whatever. And that's all under lock and key. You can't get access to anything from those cases for until about something like, you know, 2080 or something yeah, like that's, that. And that's why they can they can do that. But again, that shows that they're hiding something. Whoever's in power or whoever's in charge doesn't I don't make know. any sense because the abusers, the people who are abused are still here, they're still living. So it's not that we'll get closure if somebody's dead, but they can, do you know what I mean? It would still be good to see the files and understand that this is what they've done. Maybe find out who their relations, other people that have abused. Because the majority of people who get abused don't come forward because they're too scared. They've been that... He says you watched the Daniela Westbrook thing as well, who was abused at seven, eight years old. And it's scary for people to mention names because they're so drilled with fear and hurt and trauma and pain that they know the effects that these people can. But these people deserve to be named and shamed. They deserve to be put out there and try and protect the other kids for coming through because this stuff, I don't know if it's because more people are potentially speaking out or more platforms where people can feel safer to talk that all this stuff's coming to light, but it, it's scary to think that how much this shit actually goes on. Were you working on it and think, did you know anything about all, any of this stuff beforehand? No, I mean, I, I had covered um, court cases involving uh, abuse, but I never had investigated in any level of detail. Um, I think the thing that we discovered was that, the, in, in a sense, the notion of a paedophile ring is slightly it's almost like a myth so it what happened back then was there was no internet so if you were a paedophile 
you couldn't go looking for other pedophiles on the internet and download indecent images and all that sort of stuff. So generally, they would t- risk-taking behavior was higher. And you would get caught and you would go to prison. And when you went to prison, as a result of what you had done, there would be like a price on your head in the prison. You know, like it's the worst thing you can do, abusing kids. So once you're in prison there's like a target on your back. So all of the people that were in prison for abusing kids would be put together on a different wing. Now, what that enabled was networking. So now when you get out of prison, you've got all these pedophile contacts that you've made in prison. And if you get caught again and again, your web of contacts gets bigger and bigger and then they hook you up to their contacts and their contacts. So what you ended up with was a sort of an underground network all across the UK where paedophiles were in touch with each other through connections they'd made in prison and then through contacts of people they'd been in prison with. So when you're talking about a paedophile ring, it's not like there's somebody sitting at the top going, oh, I think I'll set up a paedophile ring. It's just that these paedophiles, that, that's how they operated. So it was almost like a safe underground network so I I won't go down the park and try and procure a kid in case he goes running to his mum I'll get a kid that can be relied on to be quiet because he's been groomed by one of my mates so the whole notion of a ring in a a way it's that's what it was called at the time and that's what we refer to it as in the story because it it was actually called the sex ring that was what the authorities called it the Shubri sex ring but it, it's not really a ring. It's just paedophiles who know each other and form connections and help each other out effectively. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that's what it is. So it's not a top-down conspiracy. It's just something that's born out of necessity for them. It's born out of their attempts to stay underground, not get caught. Yeah. So what's your outlook on the whole thing then with King... Um, what do you think the bigger picture is? Why do you think he was getting less sentences? Why do you think he was connected to bigger people? Or do you just think the law, the system is fucked? Well, the um, I don't like to form conclusions without evidence. So what I'll I'll give you is the information we have and what it could mean. So number one, we have the information that he was a police informant. It could mean that he informed on something even more serious we have the information that he was involved with a police officer it could be that he was given lenient treatment so he didn't blow the whistle on what was going on with that police officer we know that there was a link between him and the dirty dozen gang we know that the shoebury case was ongoing at the same time as the dirty dozen investigation we know that he is a police informant it is therefore possible that he informed on the Dirty Dozen, which would fit into the pattern of informing on something more severe. Because what's the only only thing more severe than raping kids is raping and killing kids. So if there were a narrative in which it would make sense that he had information which was valuable and which would have merited, in some people's opinion, giving him a a lenient sentence that would maybe fit the bill so those are possibilities but the truth is we don't know Mm -hmm. and the official paperwork has all been destroyed i'm still involved in a freedom of information battle with essex police i'm still involved in a freedom of information battle with the cps and i'm still involved (laughs) in a freedom of information battle with the um probation service and someone else who I can't even remember who that is now. But uh, I'm in, I'm I'm in, battled with everyone basically. <laughs> yeah, because they won't give you anything. Yeah. You know, it's and the excuses that they give you are ludicrous. And we what go excuses? into well, some of them appear in the podcast in the final episode. So, for example, a number now of public bodies have said we can't release files on Dennis King because it might cause his loved ones to become mentally ill. So, uh, if if it might upset his niece. We can't release it. And you're just going, what are you talking about? You know, you've got thousands of people over the years that have been... If he's abused hundreds of kids, which he has, Mm -hmm. we know that. Each of those kids has parents, siblings, grandparents, 
friends who have been affected by what has happened, particularly those who have taken their own lives, died of drug overdoses, mm -hmm. etc. The web of damage that emanates from one kid being abused is just extraordinary. So when you replicate that hundreds of times over, you've got thousands of people whose lives have been marred by what this man has done. And to, to say we can't release the files on this guy because it might upset his niece, it might upset his sister, is just disgusting. It's just despicable. It, it's such a cop-out. That shouldn't even exist as an exemption in any way. I mean, if you were to take that exemption and apply it to any other form of information gathering, it, I mean, it would render almost all journalism illegal mm -hmm. because if, you know, somebody down the road gets prosecuted for murder and you put it in the paper, it might upset his mum. I mean, it's this ludicrous reason not to release information. Pathetic. So I've got multiple public bodies which are using that as an excuse. Another one which is fantastic, which I keep getting from uh, the police, from different police forces is if we release information which concerns how we investigate a crime criminals could access that information and use it to avoid detection so we can't give you any files on this guy i mean again ludicrous we're talking about 30 year old files the idea that the police investigating a pedophile ring 30 years ago if you release those files, it will somehow give criminals today a magic key to get out of trouble anytime they get, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's ludicrous. But these are the pathetic excuses that they keep giving. Uh, meanwhile, in America, you know, if you were investigating this case, you'd just ring up and go, oh, hello, can I look at the file on Dennis King? And they say, yeah, come down tomorrow. Uh, it's pathetic, mm -hmm. the UK system compared to America. So, uh, you know, I'm still, I'm. It, technically, Southend is not even my patch anymore. You know, I was working on that story for another newspaper, which has since closed down and been reopened, but I don't work there anymore. Um, I've made the podcast, which is finished, but I kind of just don't want to let it drop because I just think it's a disgrace that yeah. they're able to keep getting out of releasing this information. It shouldn't, these exemptions shouldn't exist. You shouldn't be able to withhold information on a paedophile police informant because it might upset his sister. That's pathetic. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't exist. So I am determined to challenge that as far as I can afford to challenge it. It comes to a point where it would start costing me a lot of money to challenge it legally. At that point, it may become unsustainable, but I am sort of wedded to the principle of challenging that to as far as some, I can to keep moving forward and keep pushing for a hundred percent you should be allowed to look at somebody's files dead alive no matter what that is to understand that there's more victims out there there's more people who's been abused kids have been killed do you know well, what I mean how did other journalists yeah. treat you when um, you were doing this case well we've uh very well we've we've um won a lot of awards a lot of industry awards for it um, it's gone down, you know, very well within the industry. Um, interestingly, the media, the national media, has basically ignored it. I mean, we the podcast got reviewed by the Mail, and um, Private Eye has supported us. Um, but and the BBC, when because one of the things we achieved back in 2016 was we got the case reopened through our digging and through some of the badness that we had uncovered, we worked with the police commissioner at the time who was able to force them to review the case and reopen it. Um, now, when that happened, we got covered by BBC. I was interviewed on BBC. Um, ITV covered it and a few national papers. But since then, it's just been like radio, you know, just nothing, the national media. And that is a consequence, I think, of what happened was this story broke just as the Westminster paedophile ring story was falling to pieces. This whole Carl Beach, Nick thing was absolutely crumbling because BBC Panorama had gone away and investigated the Carl Beach story and found numerous major discrepancies in it. They'd found witnesses who had been compromised by the way they'd been interviewed. They found that he had, was reporting a murder that had never happened, provably never happened, etc. So um, 
the air was kind of coming out of the souffle of the of the Westminster paedophile ring. It was all collapsing in on itself. And that discredited, in a way, historic allegations in a, in a way that made it difficult for another case to then break through because a lot of the national media were going, well, no, we don't want to get our fingers burned on another historic abuse case because what if it all turns out to be bollocks? So that damaged us, I think, in a way. So the, the national media never... And then we had two big broadcasters in the UK last year who expressed an interest in turning this into a documentary series for TV. And again, once again, emerges Carl Beach because he ends up on trial for perverting the course of justice and gets convicted. And just as all the publicity around Carl Beach explodes, these broadcasters just lose interest again in the shoebury. I think every time there is a major scandal which turns out not to be true. I think that damages legitimate cases badly, um, which is why I'm kind of uh, I've, I've, I have a parallel interest in in false allegations. Um, I'm very interested in the psychology of that and and the often shambolic way in which they're investigated by the authorities and and the way that that discredits legitimate complainants. Who has the final decision whether a story should get put in the mainstream media or not? Is that? Oh well, it, I mean, it would be the ultimate decision would rest with the editor of the individual title. Um, but there are so many layers. I mean, so for, if you take just as an example, say today's Mirror newspaper, the stories that will have been submitted for today's Mirror newspaper will will have been at least three times what they can fit in the paper. And so every day stories are submitted to national newspapers and don't get used. It's just a fact of life, you know, because somebody buys an advert and you lose a page or whatever. So, uh, and that even happens on regional titles. You know, stories get spiked because there's no space for them and there's news judgments. Now, sometimes you might pick up that newspaper and your story has not gone in, but a story about, you know, Gemma Collins looking glum in a high street, it has been given half a page and you do think, well, I'm not sure what rationale there is for that. You know, if you've submitted a killer story, which you've worked on hard, and then it gets spiked and you pick the paper up and it's just full of photos of celebrities and stuff, you do kind of go, like, what, what is going on? But... Does that ever make you question your job then, that... What is it I'm doing it all for? No. When you um, know you should be getting the exposure from some hard-hitting stories, the, the stories that should be out there in the public domain instead of somebody walking along the street and eating an ice cream. <laughs> well, there is always a trade-off, right? So, and it happens in every industry. So, for example, there will be a lot of very worthy films that never get made because all the money's been spent on a new X-Men film or something. Or in publishing you know, you've got to balance the books. If you're paying for um, non-fiction books which don't sell very well, might sell 2,000 copies, for example, then maybe you need a Zoella from YouTube guide to how to pick an outfit that's going to sell 20,000 copies to balance the books. So there's always a trade-off. And there is a, a problem generally there's a conflict in many cases between <clears throat> what is in the public interest and what is the public interested in is the public more interested in a famine in the darfur or are they more interested in a picture of a celebrity looking ridiculous in many cases they're more interested in the celebrity that looks ridiculous and so if you fill your newspaper with famine in the darfur then you're going to sell about three copies so there is a trade-off always to sort of it's almost like um what's that phrase you catch more flies with honey than vinegar right so if you put enough of what people want to read in the paper then you will draw their eye to the important stuff but yeah sometimes you, you it's just disheartening yeah it can be but again you've just got to press on and if you're doing what you love then you've interviewed some very you've interviewed some great people like james brown's wife how did that end up coming about so <clears throat> I was 
a huge fan of James Brown, massive fan. Um, went to see him live a number of times. As I said, his last UK concert, I managed to get into the press conference and speak to him. Um, he clearly was not well at that concert um, and died about six weeks later, something like that. Um, so his wife, I was working freelance at the time for an American news website, a showbiz news website called South News. And um, I can't remember how that came about, to be perfectly honest. I mean, it's about 10 years ago now, but I knew it was a story that I wanted to tell because the, what had happened when he died, she was locked out of the property. The money men behind his estate locked her out. She was not there when he died. She was in rehab uh, for a painkiller dependency, gets a phone call to say her husband is dead, flies back to the house that they lived in, and there's all these padlocks on the door and she can't get in. And they basically told her, you're not his wife. We dispute the marriage. Um, you're not coming in. So she lost access to all of her possessions. That was the home that she lived in with her son, which was James Brown's son. Um, and they basically were turfed out onto the street. And I just was very interested in it. You know, it was about the, around the time I was becoming disenchanted with showbiz journalism. Uh, because these kind of stories don't, you know, stories about control, money men, the way the industry operates, etc., just generally don't get told. And I had an outlet that was prepared to let me tell the story, and so I I did a quite a long interview with her, and we published it. About a year ago, maybe two years ago, a national newspaper in the UK published an interview with her where she basically told all the exact same stories that she told in my interview you know, eight years earlier, and they put, speaking for the first time in this exclusive interview, I was just like, really? Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. <laughs> this, this has been out in the public domain since, I had, I've, what was that, 2010, something like that, that I did that? Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was a shocking story, you know, really shocking, and it, it's a kind of a window on, on celebrity yeah. and the way that celebrities are often not the masters of their own destiny, mm -hmm. and I think that's the most interesting thing about celebrity, which is almost never reported mm -hmm. on. What about Clive Stafford, the guy who overturned 300 different cases from people wrongly convicted? Yeah. Who was that character? Clive Stafford Smith. Um, I interviewed him for The Yellow Appetizer, which was the newspaper that I worked at when I was doing the Shubery case. But it really was just a very quick turnaround you know when you're working at a newspaper things stories come in and go out again you you turn them around very quickly so again to be honest i don't recall how that came about i do recall speaking to him i remember asking him what's your number one if, if somebody has not been is, has not committed a crime and has been arrested what's your number one piece of advice and he just said never ever 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 talk to the police Never. Because a lot of innocent people think, oh, well, I've got nothing to hide, so I'll just blab away, right? No, I wasn't there, I was somewhere else. Yeah. But you said what they do is... is so in, in most cases, in something like... Uh, in America, DNA is only recovered in between 5 and 10% of serious cases. So between 90 and 95% of cases, there is no DNA from the perpetrator. In 25% of cases where DNA is found, it excludes the police's prime suspect. So if you are in that 90 to 95% of cases where there's no DNA, there is a one in four chance that the police will pursue the wrong person. And so what they will do is if you start talking, they will just build a case around what you're saying. So if you say, oh, no, I couldn't have done it because I was at the cinema, they go, when did you get to the cinema? You go, three o'clock. When did you leave? Seven o'clock. What did you do after that? Well, I was a home of my own. So all of a sudden, you'll find now the time of death, they'll go back to the pathologist. Is there a chance that the murder could have happened after seven o'clock? Well, you know, there's no fast rules with this stuff. You know, you can only estimate rigor mortis. So yeah, it probably could have happened after seven. Now you've got no alibi, right? So you never, ever 
ever talk to the police because yeah. they would just they would build a case if they mm. think that you did it every word you say will be used against you yeah. so that was his number one piece of advice no comment all the way no comment yeah, yeah. it's just people do talk themselves into a conviction even if they are innocent you just, just saying that you were there at a certain time is enough to charge you and then that's when people panic and that's when people start sticking people in start fighting start arguing it can get messy who was the woman who did uh, Michael Jackson conspiracy was it Aphrodite, Aphrodite Jones Aphrodite Jones she was an interesting lady so she covered the Michael Jackson trial she was mm -hmm. in court every day um, and of course at the end of that trial he was acquitted everybody knows he was acquitted if you read the trial transcript it's quite obvious why he was acquitted and yet what she observed from the inside was a case which from day one was literally falling to pieces just absolutely didn't hold water and yet a media that every day was trying to make him look really really guilty and so she wrote a book after the trial called Michael Jackson Conspiracy and she was talking about the way the media covered the case as sort of an agreement like the media were all in were all in uh, cahoots you know you've got a case which objectively speaking was a catastrophe from literally from day one fell apart and yet a media that was making it sound like he was definitely going to be convicted and so when the uh, acquittal came in when the verdicts came in there was this dissonance there between what the public were all expecting and what actually happened because they had not been really told what was actually going on in the courtroom so she was a very interesting uh person to speak to what was her whole opinion on the michael jackson case she came away com convinced that, that, that that was the right verdict I mm -hmm. mean she was sat in court watching these witnesses completely fall apart um, I mean the whole case didn't I mean I could talk about that for two hours but the whole case did not make any sense at all the prosecution case they had charges on the indictment which contradicted other charges on the indictment so they couldn't both be true you know? yeah. <laughs> so, I think the two you boys know. I watched one of the documentaries the two boys that were in it but they actually gave, they were actually a character witness, I think, for Michael Jackson, the case prior. Yeah, you're And they probably... were saying he was a good guy, he was this, and then when he died, they came out and says, but I think this, the boy was a dancer, I think he'd been with like Britney Spears, and I think it was, I think yeah. when Michael Jackson died, I don't know if, what happened, but it yep. just didn't make sense to me. But they also say, I don't even know if this is true or it's fucking, but when Michael Jackson was like eight years old, his dad took him to get him chemically castrated to keep his voice. His voice never changed. I, I don't think that is true. Yeah. Um, now, yeah, you're probably talking about Leaving Neverland, that documentary. Yeah. So there, again, I, I mean, I could literally deliver a sermon on Leaving Neverland, but it, there are a number of problems with those guys and you would never know it from watching that documentary in terms of, differing versions of the stories that they've told, financial motives, parts that, you know, because when you accuse somebody of something in which necessarily happens behind closed doors, you know, so we're, what you're not talking about with Michael Jackson is a kind of a shubri allegation where there's this big gang of people and they're sharing boys around or whatever. What you're talking about with the Michael Jackson allegations is boys saying, we went behind a closed door and something happened. So it's impossible to verify whether that did or did not happen because it necessarily happened in private. So the only way to verify or to try to establish the veracity of, of what they're saying is to take the parts that you can check and check them. And the problem with those guys, um, and it could be faulty memory, there's any number of explanations, but the problem is that when you do that, the bits you can check don't add up. So for example, one of them uh, is suing and, is, and has been suing for a number of years and says he was abused between 1988 and 1992. In the documentary, he says that he was abused repeatedly in the Neverland train station. And the documentary, the way it's edited, certainly makes it look like he's saying that happened in the late 1980s, that train station did not exist and was not built until the mid-1990s, which is not only long after it's placed in the documentary, but also long after he says in his lawsuit that he was never abused again. So th when you start looking at these inconsistencies, it is, it, 
you know, the way that that documentary presented these guys as if there was nothing wrong with their stories was not really honest. Um, there are a number of discrepancies. Yeah, I think he's the most, he was the king of pop, wasn't he? He was the most famous person on the planet. There's always, again, people say there's no smoke without fire. I just don't know the answers to that. But when I watched the documentary, I thought the boys that were talking were full of shit. But again, there's been, I don't know, in America, you can buy your way out of cases and stuff as well. So it's, but there's always going to be speculation there, isn't it? especially when he's so high profile. Well, you can you can buy, in, in effect, you can buy yourself out of a case anywhere. Um, there's a, a misconception with the Michael Jackson case that he bought his way out of a criminal case, which is not true. He settled a civil case, but the criminal case continued anyway, and they just couldn't find any evidence. So the criminal case just died on its ass, basically, because they the case was rubbish. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very complicated story, yeah. the Michael Jackson one, but... It's one that I've worked on since, mm, since I think, I think I interviewed Aphrodite in two thousand and eight, and I'm still, in a in a sense, working on that story now. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, this morning I got an interview request by email for somebody making a documentary about Michael Jackson, but I need to find out what they're doing before I decide whether to talk to them. Do you do that? Do you background checks, find out who they are first. I I try to. Yeah. yeah. I got asked to do one last year. Um, I'm trying to remember what it was called. It was on Amazon Prime. But basically, I found out who else was involved with it and went, no, uh, I'm not getting involved. I mean, because the problem with, you know, the Michael Jackson case, as with a lot of cases um, where celebrities are involved, is that they attract sort of hangers-on who, who represent themselves as being in the know about a particular case, and they're really not. Um, and when I looked at, the people that they were interviewing for this documentary I was asked to do last year, it was just people that I, I knew that the other people they were talking to had no credibility, so I thought I don't want to be part of it. So I do try to find out, mm -hmm. with, especially with the Michael Jackson thing, because I get these requests all the time, and I almost always say no. Yeah. What about Michael Barrymore? How was, was he an awkward interview? <laughs> yeah, I did. God, you did your research. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> Investigative I, journalist, bro, I'm yeah. taking over. <laughs> yeah, I, it was a really weird one with Michael Barrymore. It was one of my first assignments when I joined the Yellow Advertiser was that he was doing, it wasn't even on my patch. He was, um, he was appearing on the community radio station in, um, on one of our patches. And for whatever reason, the reporter couldn't go. So they said, do you want to go and, and interview him? The station director had said that he had agreed to be interviewed. So I went over there to interview him. And he's going, I haven't agreed to any interview. I don't know anything about this. So, so he agreed to let me just sit in on the show. Um, and then what he did was live on the air he started sort of dragging me into the show and involving me in the show, and he sort of started interviewing me. So it, in a sense, it was a story that went wrong. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to interview him, but he ended up sort of playing with me like a cat with a ball yeah. of string. But I wrote it from a first-person perspective, uh, like a piece of gonzo journalism, and ended up winning an award for it at the Regional Press Awards, the yeah, East of England Awards. So... Yeah, that was an interesting encounter. But again, it was like uh, maybe an hour that I was with him. Yeah, would you ever investigate that case? Um, well, it's not on my patch, so yeah. no. Has it got to be things that you, in your area? Well, at the moment, I'm employed by the Archant Investigations Unit, which is a team of um, investigative journalists that work for the Archant Media Group, which runs about 50 newspapers, and I have quite clearly defined patches in London and Hertfordshire. So at the moment, I would not be able to investigate anything that didn't happen on those patches, yeah. So if you're going on, do you ever go undercover? Do you have to wear disguises or that now? No, do you no, just no, go no. straight in and I'm too ask questions? I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, I mean, in a sense, you know, sometimes over the phone, let's, I'll just give you an example, right? Be, uh, just of the way public bodies try to frustrate journalists. So if you ask for a document which you are absolutely entitled to see and they know you're a journalist, quite often they will find any number of reasons not to give it to you. 
so they will tell you they've lost it they'll say oh the person who's in charge is on leave or just excuse after excuse after excuse so one time at the yellow advertiser an excuse that came through was oh we've locked it in a cupboard and we can't find the key right it's ludicrous excuses but if you are a member of the public and you ring up and ask for that document and they don't give it to you that's really really serious so quite often you'll find yourself ringing up a you know a public body and saying mm -hmm. Oh, hello, can I have that document? If they say, who are you? You just say, oh, my name's this, and I live at this address. You don't tell them you're a journalist. So in a sense, you could argue that's sort of undercover, very, yeah, very light touch undercover. That. But no, mm -hmm. I've never physically been yeah. undercover. What case would you like to work, have worked on or been investigating in that you think maybe I could really do that, but that's wrong, I can find out more information? Is there any case that ever sticks out over the years where you'd have liked to have worked on? No, um, I think I think anything that I would like to have worked on, I, I have worked on a number of cases which I feel are not satisfactorily resolved, Shubri being one of them, so I would like to continue working on those. But um, if something's gone and been done, it's not worth worrying about. I mean, there's investigations that I certainly admire, you know, like Nick Davies' phone hacking or... Um, Woodward and Bernstein, Watergate, or whatever. But do I think I could contribute anything by picking them back up? No. Mm -hmm. So, an investigator, journalist, then for you, for the Sh Shubury stuff, was you just looking to get some closure and get convictions, and then you move on to something else? In a sense, it's a story that never ends, and it's hard to f define what would be the point at which I would feel comfortable letting go because the web of, of damage is so gigantic. You know, there are dozens of victims who are in terrible circumstances. You could say, I won't rest until all of those people have been given the aftercare that they deserve or whatever. But it's, it, realistically, that's not something I could ever achieve. I think what I would like, what for me would be closure, a form of closure, is to find out what Dennis King's role really was. Was he an informant? If so, what was he informing on? If you could make sense of that, if you could rationalise that in some way, if you could say, okay, he did really, really, really terrible stuff, but here's the reason they let him off. You might not agree with it, but it, there's a rationalisation to it. I think that would provide a degree of closure to a number of people. There are victims who still are looking for closure, um, but with King gone, it's very difficult to see how you could identify the other abusers because when you're being driven to be abused by somebody, they don't say to you, all right, we're going over Bob Smith's house, you know, here's his date of birth. You don't know who these people are. You don't know what their real names are. They're often referred to by nicknames. So even in order to identify those people, you need the police to do the groundwork. You need the police to go off and investigate and maybe bring you a selection of pictures and say, can you pick out the person that you were mm -hmm. taken to? But the police have shown no interest in doing that kind of work. The way the podcast ends is with the uncovery, the uncovering of, of um, a raft of problems with the most recent police investigation where they had a complainant who came forward and was willing to cooperate and there was just one disaster after another they didn't investigate anything that he told them um they didn't do even the most basic legwork massive delays in his case so he came forward and agreed to cooperate in late 2017 they took over a year to complete his interviews and a couple of days after he finished his interviews dennis king died so if they had dealt with his case properly and quickly, they might have been able to go and interview King, who, if he was dying, might have been willing to give names, might have been willing to fess up to stuff. But because of the chronic delays in the case, that opportunity was lost. Um, yeah, can that become frustrating then with the police today? Is there a, a, bit of, a bit of hate between police and investigative journalists? Because if you get information that they can't actually find, but you, you've you got it. Does that annoy them? 
I think they certainly were annoyed by the Shubury investigation because anybody is annoyed if they are already busy and under-resourced and then you dump a load of extra work on their doorstep and the police have been badly defunded for the last, you know, 10 years. Um, And in addition to that, after the Jimmy Savile revelations, they were swamped with historic cases, with people that felt emboldened to come forward. And so they're now dealing with all of their contemporaneous cases and all of their historic cases that are now coming out. And they've got less officers than they had a few years ago when they didn't have all this work. So it's obviously very annoying when a journalist then shows up on your doorstep and says, oh, here's another massive pile of work for you. Um, I think obviously it must be annoying also for the police to, uh, for you know, for me to be constantly digging up problems with the original investigation in 1990, albeit that was, you know, probably there's nobody there now that was working there in 1990, mm-hmm. but... Um, Nonetheless, it's not good for the reputation yeah. of the force. Mm-hmm. What's your social media and stuff, Charles, in case people want to contact you? Uh, I'm on Twitter at C.E. Thompson, which is spelled T-H-O-M-S-O-N. Yeah, and that's that? Yeah, I'm not on Instagram or anything like that. Yeah. So, brother, thanks for coming on today, telling your story. I think it's great what you're doing. It's a tough job, especially, obviously, trying to get some closure on working with so many different kinds of people. But fair play to you. Check out the podcast as well, iTunes. Unfinished? Unfinished, Shubri's Lost Boys. Shubri Lost Boys, yeah. So thank you, brother. Thanks very much. Take care. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.